Assalamu alaikum and good morning. I'm Dr. Rizwan, I'm from UCLH. And this, first of all, thank you for inviting for this auspicious uh, occasion here. And this will be a very extensive five-day marathon. We accepted, uh, Gopi and I, we accepted it. We didn't know that what we are embarking into. And when we sat down and started working on it, it is really, really, really hard work. And especially Gopi has done quite a lot of work and he will be, first two days will be the highlight of the talks. And then I will take you through the radiology bit of the nuclear medicine. And we will be very slow and we'll be more interactive. You can stop me anytime where you feel you need to discuss something. And I will just try to give you an outline. I don't want to go into the basics of the uh, radiology and the physics of CT. And I will just skip through the uh, basic principles so that you can get an overview of what, as a clinician, you need to look when you are reporting. So, we'll just talk about the CT, what the application of SPECT CT in nuclear medicine is. We need to understand the basic principles of SPECT CT, how it works, and how we can apply. So basic principles, as you know in imaging, will be the acquisition, how you acquire. You should have a standard protocol, how, how you are going to organize, how you're going to take to the patient from A to Z completion. And then once the patient has acquired and the images are being on the scanner, how are you going to process it? Because there are so much of artifacts which are involved in this that you need to know and you have to overcome those artifacts. And then reconstruction. This is very important when you're reporting how you are going to analyze the data, which is immense. And how you are going to utilize the SPECT CT in the clinical application. There are vast majority of uh, indications for this and how you're going to apply it and how you're going to standardize the protocols. The in the market, you will come across, you have got SPECT CT. There are commercial vendors. Which one is best? There are different vendors which the spec CT is very specific and for specific indications. In order to set up, probably you have already got, so I don't, I'll just skip through the what basically consideration you need to take into account when you are uh, putting up a service. So you need to look at the local sheathing because of the CT, camera weight, because if it is on the first floor, then you have to have very uh, strong foundation and increase power demand because the CT input is quite high, intense, and the cooling requirement because of the computers and the machine, so it doesn't shut down. And the cost implication, I think probably that's not an uh, important uh, domain for uh, Kuwait, I think. This is the SPECT CT technology. We have got three uh, gamma cameras, uh, SPECT CT, which is all uh, GE, UCL, all the cameras, we, we are basically uh, GE-oriented. The only Siemens we have is the PET-MR. The rest are workstations, everything is GE, and I'm very fond of GE. Looking at the basic principles, um, I, there is quite a lot of dimension for uh, looking at the spec, and I think as we go along and as, as you see, uh, uh, Gopi's uh, talk, you will get a new horizon of what uh, imaging uh, offers you. So there's three dimensions basically for uh, looking at, you have got nuclear medicine, you have got CT, and you have got diffuse uh, functional and anatomical imaging. It gives you a three-dimensional images, and uh, because of the CT, there is external uh, X-ray radiation, so you need to take into account of what precautions you need to take for especially female and uh, uh, in uh, less premenopausal women because you have to take into account whether they are pregnant or not. You need to get them uh, signed consent and then probably from the nuclear medicine point of view also you have to get their consent. That's the legality in the uh, United Kingdom. All these um, uh, spec CT, you need to understand the basic principles of again looking at the acquisition pro processing and reconstruction and looking at the current and the future clinical ex uh, application of uh, SPECT-CT. 
just to introduce that uh, spec CT reflects the functional status and the uh, uh, morphological basis of uh, the disease. It uh, lacks the, if you are looking at the spec only, you, you have got the functional data available, but you haven't got the uh, morphological data to correspond to, to together and marry them together and give a definitive diagnosis. You'll be a big wig that you'll see a hot spot somewhere, but where is it? You don't know exactly because of uh, lack of functionality. Um, to produce quality images, it is necessary to correct the spec data for attenuation correction and photon uh, uh, scatter. I will show you one or two examples where what I mean by this. So as we go along, I'll say why it is important that you need to correct the uh, scatter correction and uh, attenuation. The combined spec CT provides anatomical and functional and data sequentially so that you don't have misregistration. If there is movement of artifact, you can always correct those. And uh, with spec CT, lesion visualization by functional imaging can be corrected with anatomical structures. The application and introduction to clinical medicine, SPECT CT has become the fastest growing imaging modality. And it is basically best used in the uh, bone, or by, best used by the orthopedics and the oncologist for cancer imaging. SPECT CT can acquire anatomic and functional data. It's, again, it's a repetition again and again. The importance of SPECT CT is because of marrying the two more functioning and morphology together. And SPECT and CT study cannot be accurately fused without uh, multiple examining for patients and decrease the departmental productivity. So if you're doing a different uh, SPECT and a CT elsewhere, then you have, the patient has to visit the uh, department separately and it's cumbersome for the patient to come again and visit because if you're looking at the oncology patients, then they are sick, they are debilitated, they can't basically tolerate long uh, hours in the department. So it, you need to basically focus on how to manage these patients. So it is best basically to think beforehand, make an appointment, and provide the best possible uh, examination as a one-stop. And I think SPECT CT, like uh, PET CT, which has revolutionized the uh, radiology in providing the functional and anatomical uh, imaging. Looking at the advantages, now, SPECT CT, as I said, it provides one-stop service. It increases the patient comfort by shortening the scanning time. And it gives clear, sharper, and more diagnostic images. Increase radiologic, uh, radiologist satisfaction because you have got a very, you know, uh, definitive uh, imaging diagnosis. And you have got the modality which can give you a one-stop diagnosis for the further management. And basically increase departmental productivity because the throughput increases. And overall, it increased referral physician satisfaction. I think this is very important. You have to satisfy the clini uh, clinicians who are referring the patients to you. If you put a vague uh, conclusion to all your reports, then what's the use of reporting the scans? If you don't give a definitive diagnosis, this is what my interpretation. I'm a, a lot of I've got a lot of difference from the other radiologists and uh, nuclear medicine. I was trained as a nuclear physician, and then I went and did my radiology training at Oxford, and it has changed the perception of how I report. Before I probably you agree or disagree. When I was a nuclear physician, I would say this is the focal uptake in in the region, it's a region, in a region of this area and correlate place with imaging. So you are imaging, so you should be able to give a diagnosis. If you see a hot spot, where is the hot spot? Is it the head of the femur or is it in the patella or is it in the knee joint? If it is in the knee joint, where is it? Is it the medial or the lateral? So you have to be very precise. Image registration. I don't want to go into probably uh, Gopi will uh, elucidate 
probably and touch bases on uh, the protocols. I haven't, because every department has got uh, its own protocol and accordingly they adjust because of the uh, patient's different uh, cultural background and all that. So, but looking at it, whether you have got arms up or down, sometimes not important. So it doesn't matter what region you are going to do it. If you're doing, going to do a chest, then you have to be careful because of the beam hardening. I will talk about what beam hardening is. And if you're doing head and neck, then probably arms down would be better because then you need to look at the neck region. Cushions arm and leg support. This is very important because it, it is shorter interval scans, but again, you need to uh, look at the patient's comfort. So you need to make sure they are relaxed, knees slightly bent, so that they are comfortable and they don't move. If they move, then there's a problem of co-registering. Keep it very simple and reproducible. This is very important because the patient, especially in oncology patients and uh, uh, orthopedic patients, they will come again and again to you. So you should have a, uh, acquisition parameters which are standardized. You have got SOPs in place. So you, uh, the, your technicians and uh, technologists and the radiographers don't have to come back to you and ask what should we be doing. It should be standardized and it should be reproducible. Breathing protocol, again, looking at uh, the functionality and the morphology. CT is very quick. Within seconds now, with 64, 128, uh, within seconds you just do the whole body. But if you are looking and co-registering with the functionality with this uh, nuclear medicine, then you do box standard so it acquires over 20 minutes. So it doesn't matter. So whether you do it in inspiration or expiration, but you follow a standard protocol. Sources of error. So you need to be aware of what the artifacts and the errors when you fuse the images. When you are looking at the whole body or extremity, the motions are there. You have got chest, you have got limbs, and the upper and lower limb and head and neck. You can slide longitudinally, you can move laterally, so you have to take into account. Looking at the diaphragm, moving up and down, so anything with, within the di diaphragm or subdiaphragmatic or around the capsule of the liver and the spleen, it's in, very difficult to interpret if the patient has taken deep breath during two acquisition and during the, that section. Bowel motility again, bowel moves throughout so it can move I was reporting the day before yesterday uh, uh, a pediatric patient looking at the gallium uh, and comparing the two scans. The, the child had multiple mesenteric peritoneal disease and because we don't give contrast and it's not high uh, quality CT, it is just for attenuation mapping, it becomes very difficult to interpret because if you see a lesion in the uh, peritoneum or uh, cirrhosis, in, let's say in the cecum, and if the patient comes back in six months' time, the cecum would have moved. Now you have got bowel activity, and on top you have got cirrhosal and peritoneal activity. Then you say, is it the bowel or is it the peritoneum? Whether the tumor has redu reduced in size or whether the treatment has failed. So in the MDT, they were discussing, oh, by the way, this nodule here is not there. But the thing is, it has moved, so you have to take into account when you're reporting that. You have to be very open-minded, and when you go and report, then you should be looking at the movement, and then you have to see anatomically localize it, and then corresponds to the previous imaging, whether this corresponds to whatever the primary was. And as another problem is the bladder. CT is very quick, bladder when you start may be empty because the uh, patient goes to toilet, empties the uh, bladder and when, they, when you finish the uh, nuclear medicine uh, acquisition, then the bladder fills in. So if there is something sitting over the dome of the bladder or something within the uh, pelvic region, then you need to take into consideration. Attenuation artifact, particularly dense metals such as dental work and metal implants that can give artifact and then it can impair or hinder interpretation in uh, small lesions adjacent to that. 
and especially the uh, thick bones, cortical, it gives beam hardening. So I'll talk about windowing probably, I, I think it's in this talk or in the other talk. So you have to respect CT is how you analyze. It's not you acquire the data, everybody can do the uh, acquisition and then everybody can report. But how you report it is important, how you window it, because I will talk about in this that what is windowing in radiology. And it is the backbone of uh, spec CT. And software misalignment of spec and CT data is also basically you need to be aware of. CT artifact can be classified as uh, beam hardening, which can be cupping, streak artifact, dark bands, metal artifact, high density foreign material can give you streak, and partial voluming around the edges of the thick bones. Patient based artifact which can be motion artifact, transient interpretation, uh, interruption of contrast, because they are contrast in, in dynamic phase, so it can be at transit at any point and anywhere. And hardware-based artifact can be ring, tube, or output field artifact, and uh, helical and multi-channel artifact. That can be a number of artifacts. So looking at the motion artifact, so if you look at this, this station has moved. So I think I can't see it here. And this one is not uh, projecting well. Uh, how does the point go out? Yeah. So you look at this, basically the patient has moved. So you can correct that. So if you are looking, if you have a trauma patient and you're looking at it, and if you do the bone window, then you say, this is a fracture. It has happened to me. In a multi-trauma patient, when I was on call in radiology, and a patient came through, and I started looking at the CT of the head, neck, his total body. And there were multiple loosened lines going through. And I reported as multi, but then I said, it's not possible. The patient is still alive, and so much of uh, fractures. Then I asked one of the orthopedic radiologists, I said, I'm not happy with this, and he was a senior consultant. He said, repeat the scan. And we called the patient back and repeat the scan, and the artifacts are gone. So you need to be aware of what the lucent lines, whether it's artifactual or not. And again, if you're looking at feet, Gopi is going to look into it. And uh, again, you need to be aware there can be artifacts, loosened lines, which can depict as fractures. Ring artifact. So if you look at it, the vessels, the, at the hilum, and then you see these ring artifacts. So you need to be, if there are small lesions here in the liver, then you, you may miss it. Tube artifact. So it's not interpretable. So basically you can't interpret these because there's so much of art here, you can't define the morphology, you can't see any lesion, and it's, it's a rubbish scan. So you need to repeat it. Partial ring artifact, it's not coming out. So it's just there. And beam hardening. So the, the petrous temporal bone, so this is the probably just cutting through the uh, mastoid, the thickest bone. So you see the artifact and all these thick bone at the uh, uh, sphenoid. So you see these lines going through. And if you're looking at a brain lesion in this area, and if brain lesions on CT are low density, if it is a tumor, metastasis, all in fact, and high density if it is blood. So it's, it becomes very difficult. Just talking about the history of uh, CT, so it started off 1924, and probably we are somewhere here where we got uh, 16 slice uh, spiral CT. And now basically it has gone further, and we have got 320 row spiral CT. So they are the fastest beast in town. So you can just do scanning within a few seconds of total body. Second generation is started off. So you've got the detectors and uh, the source, source and the de detector. So you've got fixed uh, detectors at different intervals. And then 
the camera moves and basically is no longer used anymore. The third generation came into, and then you have got a full rotation. So this source and the detector moves at 360 degrees inside the gantry. So they are still in use. And uh, fourth generation, you've got a ring of uh, detectors, and this is the source which goes round and round and acquire images as a CA uh, sequential acquisition. Now, this is very important, so I'll probably spend some time on this. So, in, when you talk about CT, you talk about Hounsfield units. Hounsfield units is basically what the density of uh, the tissues are. So, you have got thousands, thousands of uh, combinations or the color combinations of grayscale. So, you need to know what water is, what air is, and what bone is. So basically you have to window it accordingly. If you are looking for bone lesions, then you need to know that the maximum goes to 1,000 and minimum goes to zero. And if it is fat, it goes into minus. So like if you're looking at the adrenal lesions, if you put your curse, uh, pointer onto the adrenal, and if you look at the Hounsfield unit, it should be minus if it is fat, because sometimes if it is an adenoma and is predominantly fat, then you have got minus Hounsfield unit. So it's very important you adjust your windows when you are reporting your CT. And I think that is the cornerstone of uh, interpreting CTs. If you get along with that and you understand the principles of windowing, then it will be very easy. Radiologists are not very different from what uh, nuclear physicians are. It's just they have spent more time and uh, they are become proficient in that because of looking at it and adjusting the uh, windowing and adjusting the uh, acquisition parameters. So looking at the CT window again, this is a soft tissue window, this is bone window. So you can see the definition of the cortex of the bone. Here you are well defined. You've got the outer cortex, you've got the inner cortex, you can see the marrow. Here you can't. If you don't window it properly, then you will not be able to report. If you say, okay, I've reported the spec CT and you did not change the windows and you reported on this, you will miss all the bone lesions. If you report soft tissue on this, you will miss a lot of uh, uh, disease. In my exam, I had a brain lesion, which they showed me on a CT. On a soft tissue window, there was a cortical lesion, which I could see, but I didn't know what it was, so I gave a differential. And then they said, what would you do? So, of course, exams, you know, it's stressful. You, whether you, whatever comes out is this right or wrong at that moment in time. Hopefully, I was in a good uh, mood and in good senses. I said I will do, look at the bone window. So he put up a bone window image, and immediately you had the diagnosis there. It was Paget with sarcomatous transformation into sarcoma. And that, that is the importance of choosing the window. So you've got lung window, which can basically run from window and level. So level is where you have the maximum benefit of in looking at the images at the best quality. So you've got bone and you've got brain. So these are the three parameters and uh, soft tissue, media sinus window. So soft tissue window, we adjust it according to the media sinus. So these are the one, two, three, four that you need to know. And whenever you are interpreting, if you're in the mediastinum in the soft tissue, you look at the mediastinal window. If you, you, I think the best thing is you have to structure yourself. You have to structure, and in your mind, you should be clear. When I was a nuclear physician, I had, you know, you've got a planar images, you look at the planar images, you report, two minutes, you are gone. Bone scan finished. Gopi will go through. I, I haven't done, but it's his hard work, and uh, I'm not going to touch into that. And you will see the spectrum of cases and the difficulty. If you do a spec CT, it's not like a plain art. It, it, it has revolutionized the imaging. You can spend from 
if it is a plain uh, non-interrupted, non-intervened spine or foot or any joint, it is very straightforward. You see a hotspot, you look at the CT, you say degenerative disease, five minutes you are finished. But if it is touched, if it is or surgically operated and there are implants in, then you go back to the basic. You've got an implant in, you've got a metal there. You have got artifacts, you can't see anything, it's horrendous. If you've got a knee prosthesis, you've got an ankle prosthesis, you've got a spine prosthesis, you cannot interpret unless and until you window it. You have to get rid of the beam hardening from the metal and uh, only then you see the cortex, otherwise you cannot uh, interpret the images. Probably he'll show you and I will show you some examples. Voltage and current are the two parameters in CT, but they are dependent on each other, and they are basically the backbone, and because in Europe we have got, and probably here, it's the impact factor of giving what amount of dose you are going to give, whether you want high quality images, which is probably at the expense of high dose, CT, which is a radiation dose to the uh, patient or you are basically fine with the attenuation sort of uh, imaging where you just get a crude image and then you say, okay, I'm fine, I know exactly where the lesion is and I'm happy with that. I'm not, normally my interpretation of these is I have to give a high quality image so that it is interpretable and it is, uh, I'm able to give a definitive uh, le uh, lesion localization rather than giving them is a hotspot in the region of, uh, let's say, tibia. That's it. So you have basically identified the hotspot, you have identified where it is, but you don't know what it is. Unless you basically have got a high resolution or high definitive CT, only then you can characterize that lesion in that area. It could be an osteoid osteoma, it could be a mat, it could be uh, osteoma. So I think it's very important. So as you go, so voltage you can go, you can choose from 80 to 140 kilowatts. The higher the voltage, the better the penetration of the X-rays, the better the quality of images at the expense of higher dose. And electric current MA, you can have 50 to 500 MAS, but higher the current, again, the better the image quality and less the noise, and but the larger the dose. So you have to basically get what, what you need out of the images. So you can basically choose from, uh, normally we use 100, 120, so you can go up and down depending what sort of uh, uh, machine you have. Now looking at the effective dose from CT procedures uh, in comparison to from uh, uh, other radiation dose from a variety of radiopharmaceuticals, it just gives you a spectrum of what the effective dose uh, is from different uh, tracers, uh, pharmaceuticals. So I think the top of it is gallium, which is 400 megabecals, it gives 48 uh, effective dose. So it's just a spectrum just to be aware of. This is the spec at UCLX. This has been published uh, uh, by one of my fellow from Oman, uh, Al Rabani basically, she published this data and uh, it was in uh, nuclear, is it? It was in hmm? NMC. So this is the, uh, probably y you may agree or you may disagree. Uh, it depends when we, when we get a request card from a referring physician. Uh, we look at the request card and then we decide what we need to vet it for. So vetting is basically, I don't know whether you read the forms, is uh, uh, you uh, sign off of what procedures you need to do. We have got all coded, all protocols are coded. So if it is a bone, uh, if this is the set that comes through, I will put it as INV, so it's in the nuclear medicine department, then BN is bone, and I will read it for 15. 15 is basically the radiographers know the 15 is that we have to do three phase bone scan and then we have to do a spec. If I put 13, then they know that they have to skip the dynamics and they just do a planar and they do a spec of a region of interest. So this is the 
parameters, so we use a single intravenous injection of 800 MBQ, dynamic sequential images, five seconds per frame for 180 seconds, five minute blood pool image for 300 seconds and delayed after 2.5 to 3 hours post injection and spec CT of the affected region. And then spec CT protocol is again 128 by 128, 12 seconds frame, 120 projection, 120 kV and 100 MA. So MA and kV you can adjust and 0.8 seconds is. The pitch is very important. Pitch is basically, I'll probably uh, tell you something about it because pitch is again affects the dose and the quality of the images and you have to adjust your pitch. And then we reconstruct on GE, Accelerus workstation with volumetric MI evolution for bone. And images are saved as per consultant's uh, interest. So I normally do 3D volume rendering and uh, I just look at the sagittals and the uh, axials. If you are a radiologist, you are prone to look at the axials. Without axials, you don't uh, interpret any images. This is the another protocol. The thing is, this is in evolution. So you evolve. We started off when we published that the first paper. Uh, we were using that. But I think every day we are working on it to improve the quality of the images. So this is the another protocol which we are just trying to tweak to get the best uh, images. We do quite a lot. Uh, of a uh, patient from uh, uh, Stammo orthopedic center. So they refer all their uh, post-operative. You know, the patients, they are operated on the spines, and I'll talk about the spines. And they've done the fixation, the whole spine is rigid. Again, the patient comes back and still in pain. And I've seen, I, being a radiologist, you have got MR, you've got CT, and all these patients have gone through that phase. They have had the uh, x-rays, they've got the CTs, they've got the MR, but they haven't localized where the pain. The benefit of nuclear medicine as an entity, as a department, is to help those. So these patients come back to us and say, can you localize the point of pain where there is activity so we can go in and target that uh, area. Majority of the time is either the facetal arthropathy, so you localize a facet which is probably the hottest, so they go and inject probably that's the triggering point, or pseudoarthrosis. They fix the spine, but there is still movement, and that is pain generator. Looking at multi-slice, multi-slice what we do is a, a spiral CT. You acquire the images, and you have got the whole data bank in your database. Now it's up to you how you want to reconstruct it. You can thin the slice, you can thick the slice, you can do only sections, whatever data you want to uh, utilize from that uh, pool, you can utilize it. So talking about the pitch, is pitch, pitch is defined as the table distance traveled in one uh, direction with 360 degrees of rotation, gantry rotation and divided by the total thickness of all simultaneous acquired slices. If pitch is greater than one, the, there is decrease in uh, patient dose, but there is decrease in image quality. So we try to keep the pitch less than one to get the best benefit of uh, the image quality. So if you go back, we use the pitch of 0.98. So it's just less than one. So it's basically keeping the dose within limits and keeping the good quality of images. Now this is the without CT attenuation and with CT. So if I was reporting, I would probably basically look at it and I say, oh, this is the area which is probably hot and I will report it and then look at this, there is something there, should I be reporting that? But if you do the attenuation session, this is corrected and this is the focus of lesion. So this is what I was saying. The CT attenuation correction you should be aware of. If you're just reporting spec, then you should be aware of over-reporting of uh, lesions because they are more highlighted on the, with the background activity. 
<laughs> looking at the clinical application, so I think probably that is the basics of I could, which I could tell, and I don't want to allude into the details of uh, the physics. So the application is vast, and whatever you want to do, you can do it. You can start from head to toe. So the application and indication is vast. So you can do bone imaging, imaging in infection, oncology imaging, central node localization. We do quite a lot of 131 and 123 body imaging. We have just started its uh, research with uh, ID124 PET. So we, I think my first patient was Friday when I was taking the flight, I organized everything, but I didn't see that through. So you see how important you are. I missed my first patient. And general nuclear medicine imaging and dosimetry. Dosimetry is another one of my specialty, and because I do with most of the therapies, and uh, we have got the center of excellence, and uh, we do quite a lot of pediatrics and adults, and uh, we do targeted therapies as well. So dosimetry is important. We've got spec there, so you can do volume analysis and uh, dose delivery to the target organ and then how much you need to deliver for bone marrow and renal functions, maintaining their functionality within normal limits. Uh, now, this is, I think, just the, uh, some of the literature where they, sh they have shown. It's evident now, basically, everybody, spec CT has revolutionized, and uh, people uh, have started utilizing the service, and everybody, every center is now hunting for spec CT to be put into their uh, nuclear medicine department. So looking at uh, melanoma, this is basically showing 43% of patients with negative planar scintigraphy have shown uh, disease. And Evan Sapir et al. demonstrated uh, in uh, nor cholesterol, MIBG, and 131 iodine that the spec CT accuracy improved. Looking at Horger and Tav, and uh, Husarek, looking at, again, showing the difference between the SPEC and SPEC CT, that it is very, very good in accuracy and uh, uh, specific, uh, specificity. Again, Khafi Fatel reported about 87.5 percent in 34 patients, and uh, central node identification, 94 percent of patients out of 32, 34 out of 32 and 47% of those of 32 were identified additional nodes. So the superiority of the SPEC CT over planar was published by Roma. Um, and uh, he said that uh, SPEC CT uh, was reported to clarify more than 90% of bone lesions. So that's what I was saying. So if you see a lesion, then you can characterize on the SPEC rather than just giving a lesion in some region of interest and you don't know what uh, the characteristic of that lesion is, whether it's benign, if it is benign, what sort of lesion it is. And if it is malignant, then what are the characteristic features defining that uh, uh, lesion as a sarcoma or a metastatic deposit. And there's another study, and this is by Levely, which again compared with MIBG parathyroid and uh, show sensitivity range from 34 for single uh, phase planar images to 73 percent. There's another study with MIBG SPECT, which shows uh, sensitivity of 93 percent and uh, similar with 99 percent achieved by PET-CT. So it's in comparison with the uh, PET-CT and HED carbon. So some of the bone images, uh, this is not my picture, I've just uh, borrowed it uh, from someone. So it's an osteosarcoma. Looking at the planar images, you say it's a lesion, and then there's something there in the region of this. Could be soft tissue, it could be anterior uh, skin, or it could be anything. So this is how you report it. You, know, you say it's a lesion there, and there is something in the distal metadiseal region. So this is the metathesis of the femur, and this is the uh, this is the metadi and uh, epiphysis. So it's at the junction. So you've got a fused image there. It defines where the lesion is. 
So looking at the infections, you've got a planar image. You see some asymmetry. You see the spine. You see some asymmetry there. You do have planar. It improves the uh, sensitivity of the lesion detectability. And then you know where it is. So it is somewhere in the region, but you don't know where it is. So you do ACT. Now again, uh, we will talk about CT in detail, but if you look at the, I'll give you just a, a, an overview, just a, a quick overview. So if you're looking at the spine, you're looking at something, so you've got superior end plate, inferior end plate, lateral corsetals, you see a buzz there. So it's a lateral osteophyte developing there. So if you look at this, this is very pristine, this is very pristine, you see some jagged edges at the inferior uh, end plate, early degenerative changes. Then you see some changes here, you can't clearly see it, but then again the inferior margin. When you have got a disease at two margins and you've lost this space, uh, most likely it is degenerative, you can have increased uptake. But saying that if you go back and look at the history, history is very important in uh, medicine. So it guides you what you are going to put as your conclusion. So if the patient is septic, has got raised inflammatory markers, they don't know where the focus is, blood cultures have been positive, then you will think about it, you can't find anything, and then you see this, and then if I put the fused image, then you see an uptake there. So now is that discitis? Is that because it could be discitis, and it has eroded through the superior and inferior. The similarly, exactly the same would happen with TB. You see more often here, back home, we see quite often. In Europe, it's less uh, predominant, but it's coming through. In TB, it destroys everything. So you've got soft tissue element along with that. With infection, early staph uh, infection, you see the end plate changes and you see the disc becomes uh, uh, edematous and erodes through and then the two joint surface. It's the principle of re-imaging and uh, in medicine. You, when you uh, do imaging x-rays, you do two joints, one above, one below as a comparison and you compare two limbs because they are, should be symmetrical. So it gives you a guideline of what is normal, what is abnormal. For this, again, when you do the uh, uh, CT, you basically, you need to go up and down. So you have got a few slices where you have got normal and abnormal, and then that can guide you of what is abnormal. Again, I think uh, Gopi is going to talk to you in detail about these SNIs. So again, SNI in head and neck uh, is uh, it's amazing. So CT is, is I think, uh, one of the best modalities to define uh, morphology in head and neck region. You, in, even in uh, head and neck, breast, uh, we do, we are doing, uh, it's one of the research of penile cancers, looking at SNI, central node imaging, and we are now looking at uh, PET MRI with FDG in uh, penile cancers, looking at uh, central node mapping using diffusion and PET tracers. So whether it can improve the sensitivity of submillimeter nodal involvement, because you've got diffusion and uh, uh, radiopharmaceutical as PET as a tracer of, uh, as a marker of uh, disease. So you can basically, if you've got both of them positive, the sensitivity goes very high. And then basically you correspond and correlate with the histology of uh, the SNI. So 131, we do quite a lot. This is a standard uh, patient post-therapy. They have the therapy and we do SPECT-CT. And even for a 1, 2, 3 follow-up scan in six months or a, a early a examination, they have the SPECT-CT. So you basically look at the planar images and then you say, oh, there's something there. What is it? Whether this is a lesion or there is something. So you look at this and this is the calesial activity, excreted activity within the uh, right upper calyx of the kidney. So it answers your question. You know, when 
uh, you're reporting, you put a vague report, you say this is what it is, and you see some uptake, you don't know what it is. And then the, if I was reporting, I would say, oh, is that a gallbladder or there is something there? So I don't know. But uh, spec CT clearly defines and answers your question. You see, the, again, this is not mine. And you see star architect, some excreted activity, and then you see a focus there. And normally happens. And what I've seen in my experience, which is very limited and short, and hopefully I'll develop that in future. With 131, you see uh, activity within the pelvis, and especially normally you see it at the middle. And what I've seen is, and we do spec, because we don't know whether there is a bone deposit or deposit elsewhere within the pelvis. And it's most of the time the activity is stationed within the rectum. You've got a fold that the sigmoid colon comes and it wraps around the mesal uh, sigmoid and then reflects back as a rectum and then it pulls up and then it shows you for focal activity. So this would have been reported as a activity somewhere probably within the, you can't see it on the posterior image, so it's less likely to be the sacrum or the posterior IHS. So something projected anteriorly. So any wild guess? Anybody? Volunteers? Sorry? Oh, it's written there. <laughs> okay, so that's what uh, you see, uh, CT, so this is not coming up, so you see multiple diverticula in the, and one of the diverticulum shows uptake. So more application, I think uh, Gopi is going to talk to you about, is the SNI. Sorry, going back. And again, benign versus bone. Breast cancer patient, you see uptake here, very common. You see it more often when you're reporting a prostate or a breast. So there has to be taking a mat somewhere before they can either clear them of uh, disease or they want to uh, complete their treatment. Then it's not projected nicely, but uh, if you, so the anterior superior acetabulum, uh, there is a lucency which has got very characteristic appearance. Lucency is basically when you say in imaging radiology, lucent lesion, automatically your uh, mind goes to metastasis, which is not true. Lucent lesions, you need to further characterize it. And in bone, it's very important that there are few parameters, probably it would be worthwhile once you start uh, reporting bone, that you go through that list. There is a very short list of a lesion, whether to call it benign or malignant. You have got a zone of transition, wider zone of transition or narrow zone of transition. You can define it, so it's basically the zone of transition is narrow. If it is wider, then you suspect something. The margins, whether they are sclerotic or they are non-sclerotic. The sclerosis means that it has got time to stay there and develop over a period of uh, months or years. So it's less likely, unless is indicated that the patient has had treatment. Breast cancer can be lytic or plastic. So you can have black on CT or white on CT, but predominantly it's lytic lesions. But as chemotherapy and other treatment for breast cancers, it becomes sclerotic. So you need to be aware whether that's what it is, but superior anterior lip of the acetabulum and if you look uh, at here, you see the margins, look at this, and look at this. So if you've got a lytic lesion with sclerosis and shows uptake, it's a benign geoid. Geoid is basically a cystic transformation of uh, around the joints. The synovium grows, encroaches into, and uh, 
reaches to the uh, cartilage and goes into the uh, marrow and then it seals off by a reaction and it becomes a cystic lesion. Around the joints is called geoids, G-E-O-G-E-S. Again, Gopi has got excellent images of uh, these uh, bones. Malignant, what is malignant, what is... Uh, so pe uh, the spec CT clearly defined, so one, these are burnt out images. So again, so met and physical art property. So in conclusion, the role of integrated spec CT is growing especially in oncological application and is immense. Co-registration results in high specificity as well as sensitivity of scintigraphy and reduces the number of indeterminate lesions. So that's what you want to do. So you want to reduce the indeterminate lesions and make your uh, report more diagnostic and more cumbersome. The superiority of spec CT over planar scintigraphy has clearly been demonstrated. I've shown you a lot of literatures that there is evidence and there are no doubts. It is there. And you will be able to, in most of the cases, differentiate between benign and malignant skeletal uh, diseases, thyroid cancer, neuroendocrine, we do quite a lot, and SPEC CT is basically the standard format for uh, neuroendocrine tumors. Parathyroid adenoma, we'll talk about that. We've got a lecture and mapping of SNI. Gopi is going to allude on that. And studies demonstrate superiority in other clinical applications, which um, are lacking. However, pilot studies have been encouraged to use the spec CT in cardiac and uh, neurological imaging. Uh, thank you.